Okay. <coughs> Hi. So my name is Daniel Vratil. Uh, I'm a. Okay. Okay. So I, I have to wait for another six seconds. So hello, my name is Daniel Vratil. Uh, I'm a long-time uh, KDE developer and uh, Qt user. And today I want to, want to talk to you about Qt or even more about QML, the, the Qt modeling language. Uh, the talk is not really about teaching you QML, although it's a developer conference, so I do have a few slides with code. Uh, the main purpose of this talk is to actually show you what QML can do for you, uh, how you can use it, and how, what, what really cool features it has. So hopefully after this talk, uh, you, you will, uh, well, maybe at least consider QML for your next project or maybe even for your current project. And we will know what uh, Qt or, and QML can offer you. So um, I, when QML first appeared, uh, I was really skeptical about the language because I, I thought like, well, why would anyone want to use this weird new scripting language instead of using the glorious C++ API for widgets, right? And uh, so I, I st stick to, to you know, classic API, C++. Uh, eventually, though, I got a project which was using QML, and uh, so I opened the QML file and immediately saw the code. I saw where the problem is, and I could fix it in like five minutes before, without even seeing the code ever before. And at that point, I realized I was so, so wrong about QML. Uh, QML is really simple, and it's so powerful uh, that anyone basically can use it. And yeah, since then, I'm, I'm using QML a lot. So let's begin with actually look a bit into Qt. Uh, I suppose most of you or all of you here at least heard about Qt in the past. Uh, Qt is a cross-platform open source application framework. Uh, I will just briefly go through a, like a history and something about licensing of, of Qt. So this is a very brief history of, of Qt. It started in 1995, developed by a couple of guys in Norway. Um, in, uh, the important milestone was uh, KDE, which is not actually, which is using uh, Qt, right? It was released in 1998. I will talk about it on the next slide a bit. Uh, then a couple more releases. Uh, in 2008, Qt uh, was, uh, or Trolltech, the company behind Qt, was acquired by Nokia. So Nokia actually back then had a plan to use Qt and QML, or only Qt back then. It was Qt on their Symbian uh, systems and on their smartphones. And in 2010, with Qt 4.7, they introduced QML. So QML was actually developed by Nokia. Uh, they wanted to have something that is way easier than C++ to create uh, user interfaces, mostly for mobiles, but it also works very well on desktop. Uh, in 2012, uh, Nokia realized that's not the way they want to go. Uh, they sold Qt to a company called DJI. Uh, nowadays, uh, Qt is owned by a DJI subsidiary called the Qt Company, surprisingly. And yeah, in 2012, the same year, Qt 5.0 was released, and nowadays we have Qt 5.5, with 5.6 being released, I think, in March this year. Um, one thing that people usually know about Qt is that there was a sort of a license controversy about it, because the first releases of Qt were not really uh, free, as in uh, free speech, or they were not really GPL compatible, right? The first two releases were available under free Qt and Q QPL, so the custom license is not really compatible with GPL, um, which was uh, even one of the reasons why GNOME was started, right, as a project to actually have uh, a desktop environment based on really open uh, toolkit which was GTK. Uh, there is actually there is a, a foundation called KDE Free Qt Foundation, which actually assures that whatever happens to Qt or the co company that owns Qt, whether they are acquired or they go bankrupt or whatever happens, that Qt will always be available under a proper free license. So nowadays, uh, Qt is available under GPLv2, GPLv3, and LGPL uh, in the next release. Uh, sorry, it's supposed to be Qt 5.7 release, not 5.6. Uh, there will be also LGPLv3 uh, available. So yeah, it will be, it, Qt is now properly uh, open source project with open governance and everything. Uh, now, Qt, I said, is a cross-platform uh, toolkit, and cross-platform doesn't really mean Linux, Windows, and Mac. Uh, Qt can run really anywhere. Uh, obviously, the Linux, Windows, and Mac are supported, but you can also get Qt on Android, Qt on iOS, Qt for Windows, Windows Phone, uh, QNX, that's uh, BlackBerry, and a couple more embedded uh, systems. So you can really get Qt on any platform you reasonably may want to target, right? Uh, on uh, 
Linux, obviously X11 and Wayland are supported just out of the box. Uh, Qt also supports um, uh, some frame buffer backends, so you can use it, even use it on embedded. Uh, what is a great uh, thing about Qt, and one of the most powerful parts, is that it is a platform native look, which means that if you run a Qt application on Windows, it actually looks like a Windows application. If you, run, if you run the same code, the same application just compiled for Mac, it will look like a native Mac uh, application. On Linux, we have uh, KDE has their own style, like a plugin uh, that slightly changes the default style of Qt. Uh, currently, there is a, a project called uh, Q, Q GNOME platform, I think, uh, right? Uh, which uh, basically creates, um, which basically is a plugin that makes uh, attempts to make Qt applications look native in GNOME. So you start a Qt application in GNOME and it will look like a GTK application. So uh, you can really, and if you, if you, t if you are targeting uh, another platform and, or you want to have a specific look, you can just write your, this plugin yourself. So uh, then you can create your custom uh, look and feel packages very easily. And it, also can, it can also affect your QML code. Uh, we, will, we will show that later. So this is an example of the Qt Designer on Windows. Uh, Qt Designer is you know, the tool where you can just click, 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 and create UI. Um, this is uh, how it looks on Mac. So you can see that it, this looks like basically a native application, and that's without any piece of you know, changes to the code of the project. So nowadays, uh, Qt is really everywhere. It's not just your computers, but you know, phones, televisions, uh, coffee machines, fridges, Qt's everywhere. You don't see it because it's using, usually you cannot re even tell that it's Qt because the, the looks is customized and everything. But really, Qt is everywhere. So if you, if you have a project where you want to target more than just Linux, then Qt is a really great choice for that. So <coughs> now to finally, finally speak about QML a bit. So QML is a declarative language. Um, the, the declarative means that uh, unlike with C++, where you would just say, you know, in sort of commands, do this, do this, do this, do this, in, in, in the QML, you actually describe the entire thing uh, in a declarative way, right? So you, you, you just describe the hierarchy of the objects, how they are nested, uh, what are the properties, and how you describe it, that's exactly what you get on the screen later on, right? Uh, so it's really easy, and because it's a scripting language, uh, you, can, you can actually, um, well, you don't need to recompile everything, right? Once, when you change something, you just restart the QML viewer, and you see the change. So it's really great for quickly prototyping the UI because you don't have to, you know, just just try to change this one, pick, make it one pixel wider, recompile everything, run it again. You know, in QML you just change it, reload the file, and you are done. Uh, one important note: uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm some, sometimes this is being confused for hi uh, historical reasons when the separation wasn't like that, but QML really is just language, right? When I say QML, I really mean just the language, nothing else. Uh, the language on its own cannot do anything, right? It's just a syntax. Uh, uh, to, to, in order to be able to instantiate some, some, some objects uh, in the QML, you need some components, right? And uh, there is a set of components or a module called Qt Quick, which contains uh, the basic simple components like rectangles, or uh, some scrollables, and, and this stuff. But you need to import it first, right? Without that, you have a cool language, but nothing to create in that language. There are more modules of components, obviously. So you have Qt Quick as the default one, shipped with Qt. Uh, Qt also offers Qt Quick controls, which are the actual use, uh, widgets, like buttons, uh, checkboxes, radio buttons, and this stuff. Uh, and then there's Qt Quick layouts, which provides layout uh, for, the, for, the, for the controls. Uh, there are some uh, graphical effect uh, modules, which provides a fancy, fancy graphic eff graphical effects. Uh, or you can just create your own. Right? You can just write your own uh, module, uh, usually in C++, but you can also create a, a module just by putting a bunch of QML files together and saying this is a module, and you install it into the Qt directory. And then from your QML code, you can just say import you know, my module, and QML will import your module, and make the components that you created there available uh, in the QML file. Uh, speaking of the, the plugins, uh, another great thing about QML is that it's extensible. It's extensible through C++, uh, which is not that great uh, if, you, if you want to avoid C++, but still. So um, as I said, you can, yeah. Yeah, 
So there was a comment that it's also, there are also uh, bindings available, like for Python, so you can actually write, uh, create plugins in Python as well, and maybe other languages. I, I think I remember there was also Ruby bindings, right? But go, yeah. I, so um, anyway, yeah. So let's uh, focus primarily on the C++ plugin, but obviously it will apply on the other languages as well. Uh, so you can um, imagine you have uh, you have your your huge application, like a, let's say a video editor. So obviously you don't want to implement your logic in QML or JavaScript, right? That you just don't want to do that. So what you do is you you write uh, a bunch of uh, C++ classes that implement the actual logic, right? The business logic of your application, and then you export them as a plugin. So you, you can have uh, a model which gives you access to the files. You can have some sort of a timeline which shows you the, the, the videos you are editing and stuff like that, implementing it in C++. And you create this as a, as a C++ plugin that you install with your application to the system. And then from your QML, you really just import this module and you immediately have these objects available. So you, in a QML, you just create a list view and then you attach the model that you actually created in C++ to the list view in QML. This means that uh, QML, being a different language, sorry, being a different language than, than you know, C++, uh, it enforces you to, to keep your UI and logic separated. It's, the separation is very strict, right, because these are two different languages, so you look at it and you clearly see the border. When you are writing your UI or when you are implementing an application uh, using the, the normal key widgets uh, in C++, uh, you can try, or you will obviously try to keep your UI and logic separated. But since it's the same language, eventually, you know, your logic starts bleeding into UI and vice versa. Uh, with QML, it's really easy to do the separation, right? Because they are different languages. Um, so the approach is to uh, actually, uh, so, so the question is, how do you, how do you uh, then get your logic connected to the, to the UI, right? So one of, the, one of the possibilities is the plugins that I mentioned. The other possibility is that you actually have a, a C++ application that, uh, instead of a normal window, creates a QML window and loads the QML file. And uh, then it basically create, instantiates you know, all of your application logic objects, controllers, whatever, and then injects them into the QML context, uh, basically as global variables. So you can reference them from the QML and access them like, like if they were pointers in C++. Uh, I will not uh, probably show or talk too much about the UI, uh, about the C++ integration late in this talk, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely possible and it's used a lot. But it's also possible to create a pure QML applications, right? QML is uh, using JavaScript for uh, basically extend, uh, to also provide some, uh, some non-declarative, uh, so some imperative uh, uh, programming or way to because not everything can be uh, expressed with the with declarative approach, right? Sometimes you need that bit of imperative programming when you say, well, do this, 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 and uh, it somehow affects the, uh, the UI, but uh, mostly, mostly you, you, you are okay with just the declarative approach. Um, so QML is so awesome, I actually use it to write slides. And uh, to create this abomination took me like 15 minutes, right? So, and there's like, I don't know, six things happening at the same time. And this is all really like, I don't know, maybe 100 lines of code in the, in the slides, right? So yeah, QML is easy. And now, okay. Uh, now, since this is a developer conference, I need to show you some code. But the, I, will just, I, I really just want to um, explain how the basics work, right? We won't go into the deep details. Although after this uh, couple slides, you actually will be able to write a simple QML application because it's really easy. So uh, the, in this piece of code, we actually create a blue rectangle. Uh, the syntax is very intuitive. If you ever saw any programming at all, you get the idea of what's going on. So on the first line, we just import the Qt quick. So we need to import still QML, which module uh, of components it should import so that I make it available, right? Because as I said, QML is just language, there are no components, no rectangles, nothing. So we import Qt Quick, which contains, among other things, the rectangle. And then on the next line, we just say rectangle and curly braces, and that's it. This way we tell QML, please create an instance of rectangle. 
And then we use the JSON-like syntax to just set a couple properties. So we set x, y, uh, width, height, and color. And what we get is a blue rectangle, yay. Now, um, you, can, you can also create your own, uh, extend the object by adding your own properties, right? But that's, a, uh, I will not go into it here, but it's possible to have your own properties added to it, and then all the things that I will show later apply to these properties as well. Now, a question, like, what if we want to put another rectangle inside of this rectangle, right? A ref, for instance, what if, want, what if we want to put a red rectangle into the blue rectangle? Well, it's easy. We just put uh, another rectangle into the rectangle in the code as well, right? So we just nest another rectangle into the blue one, and magic happens, it also shows inside uh, on, the, on the screen. Uh, there are a few things that you might notice. The blue rectangle is the same as on the previous slide. In the red rectangle, in the nested one, uh, you might notice a couple weird things. Um, first is that we, nothing is really, we don't use any absolute positioning, right? The, the, the geometry of the red rectangle is relative uh, to the parent. So in, in the X and Y properties, uh, I use parent.width. The parent is sort of a magical variable that just refers to parent. So in this case, it refers to the blue rectangle. And I do some math to make it just, to make it, uh, to put it in the center. For the width and height, I just refer to the blue rectangle explicitly, right, using the ID property. Um, this allows me to, the, uh, using the explicit uh, reference, the explicit name allows me to reference any other object in the hierarchy, right? In this case, I only have one other object. Well, if there was, you know, much more complicated tree, I could refer any other object in the tree using the ID. Now, what you might also notice is that uh, I'm referring the width of the red rectangle before I actually assign to it, right? So on the line, what's it? Well, for the x, right, I say width, like the width of the red rectangle. But I only initialize the width uh, a couple lines later. So how is this not an error? Uh, well, the properties are defined in the object uh, in the object in the module that we imported. So the rectangle has defined uh, a bunch of properties, including the width, height, and others. So uh, by default, they just have some default value, like zero. So in this case, uh, I'm just saying, well, take parent width minus zero divided by two. So then uh, the, the red rectangle should probably be off center, right? Because the math doesn't work yet. The width is not yet initialized. Well, the great thing about QML, and this is one, one of the most powerful parts of QML, is something that these are not just simple expressions. These are also called bindings. Uh, uh, the expressions are, can be any JavaScript expression that you want. Right? It doesn't have to be this simple math. It can be something way more complicated. It can be a function call. You, know, you can have if, then, any way of any complex expression. You know, and it's just about the return value of the expression. Right? That's what gets assigned to the property. So in this case, a binding means that when I'm referring to some property in the expression, QML remembers that. And whenever that property changes, a QML will automatically evaluate all these expressions that somehow refer to it uh, again and update the value, update the result, right? So, yeah, uh, when, the, when this file is, this uh, rectangle is being created, for uh, the first step, the, the, the x is assigned, but it's off-center, right? Because width is still zero. But when we assign to width a couple lines later, uh, it actually gets, the QML knows that there is another property referring to width, and it will again calculate the value of the property, and then the rectangle moves to the center. Right? And this is not happening only during the start of the application, this is happening all the time. And we can make a uh, pretty nice use of that. So uh, here we have, uh, again, a blue rectangle, a text, and an animation. Uh, the property animation thing at the end uh, is a non-visual element. So Qt Quick doesn't have only rectangles and texts, but it also has non-visual elements that you really cannot see, but they have some functionality. In this case, property animation, uh, we, we just said what we want to animate. So we animate the blue rectangle and the property width of the blue rectangle. We say one, we want to animate it from you know, 200 to 600, so the width will just grow and then for uh, duration is five seconds, and then we just enable it, right? So yeah, that's what's happening, right? The animation is changing the width of the blue rectangle, so it's growing and it's looping uh, again and again and again. What's interesting is that nowhere in the code is nothing like uh, 
Well, normally in C or C++ or any other language, what you would do is you would have to have a callback connected to, I don't know, on uh, width change or on geometry change signal, right? You would have to have a callback connected to it, and you would need to get the new width of the of the rectangle and then set it to the text, right? So so that the text gets being updated. Uh, in QML, there's nothing like that, right? There is no callback, nothing involved. Uh, all the magic is uh, in the text property of the text element, right? We assign, we say the text uh, is equal to, you know, uh, math.floor uh, of blue rect width. So math.floor is uh, uh, JavaScript, right? That's from JavaScript, right? There's, uh, JavaScript has this math library, so uh, which is also available in QML, so you can use things like this, right? So it's completely valid ECMAScript. Uh, and yeah, QML is smart enough to know that even though the blue rectangle width is just an argument of the floor function, it still knows that it needs to evaluate the property every time the width changes and update, uh, update the value of the text property. And this way, uh, the text automatically updates itself, right? And this makes so many things so easy, right? Because you don't have to have any more like random connecting to a signal somewhere and then having a callback somewhere else which changes you know, properties of this object somewhere else. Right? You have the object and then you see that this property of this object depends on exactly these things. Which makes it really easy to navigate. Right? Uh, it makes it really easy to uh, fix and find bugs and change behaviors. Right? Because you don't have to go and find all the places where this button is being disabled right? in the code from some random callbacks. You just look at the button, you find this enabled property, and then you see the expression which says, disable it if this condition is true, or this condition is true, or this condition is true. So we just change it, fix it, and you know that nothing else would be affected the button. Right? So it's makes it makes it really easy to fix the bugs. Actually, I have this uh, more useful example we are finally getting to actually getting to actually showing some widgets here. So here I have uh, a combo box, a checkbox, and two buttons, right? And uh, the properties of the, the the checkbox and the buttons somehow depend on the state of the combo box. Uh, right. So so the checkbox will be checked if the first item in the combo box is selected. The first button will be enabled only if the second item in the combo box is selected, and the third button will be only visible if the third item in the combo box is selected. So this is something like you, you do often in your UI, right? You, you, you have parts of your UI enabled or hidden depending on some state of some checkbox or some, some combo box value, right? So if I go and switch it to item two, as you would expect, uh, the button is now enabled, the checkbox is unchecked. Right, and there are no callbacks or you know signals or anything. Right, it just I just you know set the condition, send the uh, the property of the button depends on some condition, and whenever that condition changes, then QML will reevaluate uh, if the condition is true now, and then update uh, the properties accordingly. So this makes it really simple to to create create UI. Right, uh, another. Uh, Great example how QML makes it easier for you to, to create UI. Uh, here we want to create a bunch of radio buttons, or well, it could be any buttons or any other widgets, right? Um, and, but in the code, we actually only had to mention it only once, right? We just say the radio button once, and we use a component called repeater. And then we pass some data to the repeater, and then the repeater instantiates the, 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 the radio button for each, uh, of the, of the each, of the, uh, each item in the model. Uh, the model can be anything. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, a tip, it's a simple JavaScript array uh, which with, with uh, objects. Uh, it, can be, it can be just a it can be, uh, just simple array of strings, array of numbers. Uh, it can be uh, basically any JavaScript array. It can also be a queue string, so a queued container class. Uh, it, or it can, be, it can even be a queue abstract item model derived class. So that's like the queued base class for models. Right, so it's very, very versatile. So you don't really, you don't need to. If you have simple things like this, you don't have to implement like uh, a complicated Q abstract item model subclass in C++ and import it. Uh, you are perfectly, <coughs> sorry, you are perfectly okay with uh, just some JavaScript array, right? But if we would get to something more complicated, then you maybe want to go to to have a C++ model, or um, you can do. Uh, uh, with a model, actually, this is, for instance, what the uh, network management applet in KDE does. It has models uh, implemented in C++, 
which talk to network manager and they provide uh, information about uh, you know the available Wi-Fi networks and the strength of the signal and stuff like that. And then we just uh, import these as a as a plugins or as a modules into the QML and uh, attach them to to a view. And then so we get the data fed to QML from C++ doing the complicated you know talking over Dbus with Network Manager. But the actual visualization happens in QML where we have the list view and a bunch of delegates to to actually visualize the items differently and so on. So yeah, uh, that was more models. But here we have a, just a simple model. Well, and the QML what it does is that for each of the uh, each of the item in the model, it just instantiates a new radio button, right? In this case. So here we have it. Uh, so I can even switch those. Um, yeah, there's a there's a special property called uh, model data. Um, which is uh, something called attached property. I will not go into that in detail, but it just makes it, uh, it just makes the data of the current item available to, to each of the, each instance of the radio button so that uh, we get the title and the default checked state uh, basically propagated from the model to the, to the radio button to the delegate. Okay, that's it. That's the last slide. Um, uh, I decided to, to show you how easy QML is. I decided to take a risk and actually write some program here during the presentation. Actually, I will not write the program. I, won't, I will show you how to create a, a simple QML calculator without actually writing any code. So I will sit down. I will try to close this. Right, so let's create a new project. We create a Qt Quick Controls project. We call it a calculator. Uh, let's use new version of Qt. Yes, please. Okay. Well, this is code. Code is ugly. Let's let's use something else. Increase the font. We don't need font. We will do it. Ah, okay. We will not do it. Let's try again. That's better. Okay, so we have a window. Uh, sorry, it's so small, but um, oh, the screen is small. So let's create a calculator. So for a calculator, we will need a bunch of buttons, right? So come on, work. So let's have one button. Ah, uh, this will be slow. So QML uh, was created actually with non-developers in mind. Um, so the idea is that you can actually have your designer or people from the design team actually have to come up with mock-up. Instead of just write, creating mock-ups in, I don't know, whatever tools are used for mock-ups, uh, I don't know, Photoshop, MS Paint, whatever, uh, you can, they can actually create a simple UI in, in, uh, actual in, in QML, right? You don't really have to be a developer. You don't have to be a programmer to get the idea how to create QML. You just saw how simple it is. So you can, you can have uh, basically your design team or designers uh, actually create a, a working uh, mock-up or working example uh, or UI prototype in QML uh, just like this, right? And then so you can have the, these people create the UI and then just hand it over to developers who just bridge it uh, with the C++ backend they, they wrote. And everyone is happy, right? Uh, the designers cannot complain that you made it two pixels wider than they wanted. And uh, you don't have to bother with, uh, well, stupid UI. So let's make this bigger. And let's, um, so let's make this fill the rectangle. Um, let's set some margins. <coughs> yep, that looks good. Um, we want to get rid of the text. Um, now we label the buttons. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. I, I cannot really zoom this in, I'm sorry, but hopefully you get the idea of what I'm doing. Uh, nine, nine, this will be zero, this will be plus, minus, equals, and clear. Now we put it into some sort of layout so it doesn't break when we change the window size. So let's hit grid layout, and magic happened, okay, cool. 
So now we have a UI. Um, I can just I can just run this. Yes, please. Except, okay, I need to compile it first. Done. Okay, so that's it. We have a UI, right? It took me three minutes, maybe less. Right, so we have a UI that works. I can actually click the buttons and everything. Uh, now, how do we make it uh, to actually do something? Uh, go away. So I can still, I could switch to the code and start implementing the behavior in, in the code, but why would I do that? I can, I can, I can do it from here, right? So there's a, this says button one, so that's the button I want to um, create, do something for. And there's a signal handler, so uh, the button, the button will, uh, when I click it, the button will emit a clicked signal. And in QML, for each signal, you automatically get a handler called on something. So on clicked, on text changed, on whatever. So we uh, connect to that. And the action we want to happen, oh, OK, I will do one more thing. And that is I will rename the, the label that shows the, the current result to result. And what I want to do when I click the button is that in case of the first button, I want to result.text just append one, right? So this is a simple, super simple JavaScript expression. Just append, you know, to, to, to the, we just append to the text property of the text label here, right? So we do this for each button. Uh, this might take a, lot, a while. So unclicked, we append two. For three, we append three. Three. For plus, we actually append plus. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, this is a bit of programming, right? I don't really think this is real programming. Anyone can do this kind of, you know, just writing a simple expressions. They, they are actually quite intuitive. So even if you are a non-developer, you can still do this uh, simple stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it makes it possible to actually, uh, you know, with QML, you can just sit down with uh, your fellow developers and you can quickly prototype uh, some ideas for UI. And you can even get you know the idea how it looks like uh, and what it, what it will do, right? Mockups and wireframes are fine, but the problem is that they they they, they are not moving, right? You, you don't see what what's going to really happen when you click a button or when you you know just change something. While uh, with QML, really doing stuff is so easy and so uh, you 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 are done really fast. Um, this will be zero. This will be so for the clear button. I will just instead of uh, appending, I will just set the result text to empty string. And now for the for the equals button, I will just um, I'll off screen. Uh, I will just do well. I will. This is JavaScript, right? So I can use eval to evaluate the expression uh, in the text field, right? And assign it back to the text field. So let's see. Build and run. Hope I didn't do any typo. So let's see. Uh, how much is 42 minus six? That's six, right? So I created a working calculator without actually writing any real code, and I'm <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so yeah, so this is how easy it is to prototype or create something with with QML, right? Uh, so I will not try to improve it because that's when things would go wrong. Uh, so I think I will end this talk. So if you have any questions. Uh, the entire desktop, like this whole thing, is QML. Um, there is a lot of obviously a lot of C++ backends uh, involved in there, but the entire shell is is in QML. Not the applications, but the shell as the desktop shell. Indeed, I, I can I can show you, for instance, uh, the desktop settings dialog, which is like a settings dialog for uh, the desktop. Is also this is also completely QML, complete QML, QML UI, right? And you can see the, the, the animations when it switches. You get it for free with QML because you just said, well, animate a property, you know, X or Y, and then it just instead of disappearing in, in instantaneously, the animation just makes it makes it slide away slowly, and it's like five lines of QML again, maybe less. How much does that plasma thing? For uh, for the plasma thing, uh, quite a lot. Um, there is a the problem is that there are things that you cannot really do in QML, right? Handling multiple screen support, you know, uh, getting access to files. So you need to have the file system uh, access implemented in QML. 
And then there's a lot of logic involved, right? The, how wide the panel should be and everything. So yeah, but uh, uh, basically the, uh, so, but this is the, like the, the application logic, right? The, the actual UI is, is QML. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. Um, for instance, uh, uh, the problem with the components is that the controls are really properly available only on desktop. You can have them on phone as well. For instance, on Android, they work rather nice. But for instance, BlackBerry, they they don't really have cute quick controls. So the buttons I showed you just now, they have their own uh, module that have they have their own components there. So if you are developing from Yola or BlackBerry. You, instead of importing cute quick controls, you import you know com .yola something, and then you get uh, the Yola components, which might have slightly different API, slightly different property names than the BlackBerry ones, and which might be slightly different than the cute quick controls. So yeah, eventually, if you want to target uh, all the mobile platforms with uh, at once, you will have to have a different uh, UI for each platform. But then again, it's easy, right? Because your actual logic, the C++ code, you share on all platforms because that's in C++. But, and you just have different UI for different, different platforms, which is actually good because then you get native look on each platform, maybe adapted to the size of the device. Yeah, well, they are not new. They've been around since for a couple of years, for quite a few years, but they've been rewritten like many times. But they support custom styles, so you can actually have your custom style uh, library uh, that so you can make your own. Uh, basically, this is what you can see here, right? That we have not the default cute uh, looks, but we have the, the components here actually have a KD breeze uh, theme, so they look differently. Right, so what choices, what, what, can, what else you can use uh, except for C++ for backends? Um, well, uh, I've already mentioned that you have uh, at least Python, Ruby, and Go bindings. Uh, I'm sh uh, I, I think I heard about uh, Erlang bindings, uh, Haskell bindings. So if you like obscure things, why not? Um, I'm not I don't know what the state of these bindings is, but uh, at, least, at least Python is definitely doable. Uh, you can, you can uh, write, there's PyQt, uh, right? You can write the entire Cute applications with Python, and which and so this applies to uh, writing a backend for QML code as well. Well, the bindings uh, first the bindings are not offic officially developed by Qt; right? uh, they are developed by other company. Um, I think you don't get. Like 100% API compatibility. Like there are things that you cannot copy easily in Python, like templates. So there, the, there it is maybe slightly different. But the general stuff uh, is like one to the API is one to one. Yeah, that's. I think I need to restart. Yeah. Uh, come on. I need to wait to jump to the last slide quickly. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, does this 
drives this back into the model, or how is this exactly implemented? So that's when, how does it exactly work when, when you pick, because it doesn't update it from the model, because it would reset it? Uh, right, well, you wouldn't see it in the code, right? When I, when I change the button, you wouldn't see change the value in the code because the code is separated. Um, I think that you can, you, this doesn't happen, but uh, we can take a look after the talk. I'm out of time, so uh, let's check it after. Thank you.